eventually see Berkshire Hathaway Home Services and Master Real Estate. There's sometimes, I know, uh, uh, Rob Peltier asked me to film all this to share this with other people, but I get in trouble when I say Berkshire Hathaway, I live on the Home Services, so I'll try to properly say the correct words when I say who we are. Yes, I agree. I'm not compliant a lot of time. But, um, but uh, we really focus on culture in our organization, and we've been very, very fortunate enough to have a couple national honors. The first one is uh, last year, Entrepreneur Magazine named us the number 12 company in the United States. We were the only real estate company in the top 30 on that list for large companies. Uh, and Entrepreneur Magazine, again, just told us a couple months ago that they're going to name us in the top 50 this October. They won't tell us where we rank them at. So we really spent a lot of time, energy, and effort on, on that. And then another thing, which is a video that um, Brooke's going to play here in a couple minutes, is that a, a national TV company called The World's Greatest um, interviewed us. We were one of 200 companies they interviewed that had received recognition for culture on the national level. And they picked us out those 200 companies to be um, a company that they, they aired as a TV show that they aired in May on company culture. So there's a quick four or five minute takeaway from that that we'll play here a little bit later, kind of focusing on who we are. What I want you guys to do throughout these processes is if you have questions or thoughts, please, please, just remember we have that ready. Okay. Just please ask, she's playing it. Uh, please ask us questions throughout that process. Um, as you walk into our building down there, you saw kind of that lobby area. We got that crazy painting in the hallways. We got quotes from Steve Jobs and Henry Ford and other people. Is we really want you to walk into an environment in our organization that creates this upbeat, high energy. We want you to feel like you're walking into Apple or Google, not a traditional real estate brokerage or a bank or a law firm or something like that. We believe activity breeds activity, that you can create an environment where people actually are excited and, and about coming to work on a daily basis where there's a passion, a positive attitude, and so forth, you do that. And we think by adding craziness to this and energy that we found with our organization, it really allows us to grow our business. So I'm gonna let you play this video real quick, and then we're gonna let Mary Lee introduce herself and, and dive into this, guys. For most of us, Berkshire Hathaway is a recognizable symbol of excellence, and it's no surprise that the tradition continues with its real estate franchise in Omaha. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Ambassador Real Estate is a residential real estate company based in Omaha, Nebraska, that focuses on uh, buyers and sellers, helping find them houses of their dreams, and helping them sell their house. We really have a culture that we focus on first and foremost more than anything else. And to us, that means an environment where we have energy, excitement, enthusiasm, and people are walking around with passion and positive attitude. We believe activity breeds activity. So by bringing people into our space on a daily basis where they actually want to come to work, I think we have a unique environment for the residential real estate world where we have agents out all the time and it really gives them the ability to be encouraged by others, to be a sponge, to learn from others and they're just this upbeat environment that makes everybody more energized as they continue to walk through the day. From coaching to company events and team building, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Ambassador Real Estate is a company that cares deeply about the people who make it great. The thing that really is amazing about our company culture is it's really tied to coaching where we are really talking to our agents on a regular basis about how to nurture those relationships they have with our buyers and sellers to add value to them in the process of buying and selling their home. And so that coaching component really helps them grow and it really helps them connect with their clients on a personal level. One of the things that we focus on of many to strengthen our company culture is really we try to have an events outside of just talking about business. We want to have events where we're having grill outs, we're doing things within the community where we're actually bringing not just our agents together, but we're bringing our agents, their significant others, their kids together, so our agents can get to know each other on more of a personal level. And we found when that happens, it's easier for them to collaborate and to basically do transactions together, which ultimately at the end of the day helps our clients when it's a smooth transaction for them. One of the other things that really is unique to our organization, especially compared to other real estate companies, is we want individuals to be the unique individual they are. So we encourage them in their offices to design their spaces to meet their personality. Be who you are. It's going to make you more comfortable coming into the workspace. We've got a custom made uh, conference room table that doubles as a ping pong table that has a Stella machine in it. We have a workout facility in the basement. We have agents that have pinball machines and foosball tables and so forth. So. We encourage our agents on a regular basis to say, personalize your space, 
make you feel at home when you're here because we encourage them and want them to be in the office on a regular basis, even though real estate agents aren't required to be here on a regular basis. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Ambassador Real Estate is also a company that cares deeply about the community. There's a couple things that we really do from an outreach to the community uh, that we really focus on. One is the Sunshine Kids, which are kids with cancer, and the other is a thing called the Open Door Mission, which is a large uh, homeless shelter here. We believe that if you've been uh, uh, fortunate in life to be successful, that you have a responsibility to give back to the community. And so that's two focuses that we really have and are near and dear to our heart. Setting the bar in company culture, Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Ambassador Real Estate is one of the world's greatest. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right, so Mary Lee Blaylock, and I am the president and CEO of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services California Properties, which is all of Southern California. We have almost 3,000 agents and 58 offices. So he has one office with an incredible culture, and I have a hope and a dream for all of our offices to have the same type thing. So that's my, that's my spiel. 25 years in the business, and we'll get to some other details on that. Why don't you start out with a couple of things that you think uh, internally within your organization that you do that makes it a great culture where agents are actually excited about being part of what you're doing? So I would say the number one thing is to, uh, I'm, I'm very much myself. And if and you want to stand up, you can, by the way. You said I will. I know I will. I'll, I, I also have a, a suddenly, a, I, I turned 50 this year and then my lower back went to hell. So I'm very excited about that. But anyway, I might have to stand just because it hurts to sit later on. So I would say that one of the, one of the biggest things that I absolutely believe in is that I'm truly myself. And if someone wants to have a tough conversation with me, I have a tough conversation with them. But I'm going to say no if no is warranted. And I hope that at the end of the conversation, they say thank you anyway. That's kind of the, the, the overarching definition, in my opinion. Be authentic, be myself. And that's what I've deployed in everything within the organization. So just to back up a little bit, because I think it's important for you all to know that while that's my position today, it wasn't my position four years ago. So my husband and I and our three children uprooted and moved across country. Um, and it will be four years that I've been in California at the company, at that company in October here. And so I was an outsider. So to come from the outside into an organization that's already established with 3,000 agents, first of all, you have to prove yourself. And second of all, you have to earn the right to say no. So what I just talked about is who I am, and I've always been very honest and forthright and authentic, I hope. But it is you have to recognize the difference between dictating and earning the right. And so I guess that's probably one of the biggest things that we've deployed. And then culture follows, if that makes sense. So we'll get to that. And I would tell you, I, I'm amazed when I talk to other brokers in this market and other markets that are scared, and, and it truly is fear-based, to talk to their agents and have what I'll call these awkward, uncomfortable conversations. I mean, I've had conversations with brokers in this market, and, and they're telling me on the phone that I think what my agent did is absolutely positively wrong, but they're not going to tell them to change it because they're scared to death that the agent's going to leave them. And so when you're operating out of a fear-based uh, mode, the truth is at the end of the day, they're not going to respect you. So I believe that when you go in there and say, listen, this is what we do, and, and, and I'm a fan of not cutting deals. You can't cut deals for agents because anyone that's naive enough to think that doesn't get out and wreck a culture is crazy. Every time I see companies cutting deals, inevitably they're always shrinking because they're on the defense. So you just can't do it. You've got to say who you are. You've got to be fair in all of your decisions. But when you go to a top producer, I see Deb in the back of the room, and you say, hey, you know, here's what's going on. Tell me what's going on. Listen to their side, right? you got to listen to both sides because there's always two sides to the story where you're like, I think you screwed up and you need to make this right. I think you need to stand by that and have them. Deb, would you agree? So sometimes they may be mad for a minute, but usually at the end of the day, I would argue your top producer is going to respect you more. You're going to add more value to the process because you're doing the right thing. And that goes through the entire organization. I had a text from a top message, a top agent last week going back and forth saying other people were saying things that just weren't true. And he, he basically at the end of the day says, you know what? You've always had my back. You've always shot straight with me. You've always told me the truth. We haven't always agreed. But I respect that and I'll be here because of that. 
because he's hearing things. I'm like, this is just absolutely not true. And the credibility, when you get into those tough situations, they're asking those questions, then they believe you when you're telling the truth. Sometimes you'd be telling the truth, and if you've not had those awkward, tough conversations, they don't believe you even when you tell the truth. Right? So at the end of the day, it will create a culture. But I'm telling you, don't cut deals. Be fair to everybody. And you're going to gain a lot of respect in that process. I'm just going to add, just don't cut corners. And one of the things is I've always said, you have to do the right thing. And that has never been the easy thing. Don't confuse the two. They are two totally separate things. Do the right thing. And it generally means you got to roll up your sleeves and work a little harder to get it done. One of the things that I really want to talk about, Scott, I'm going to ask you to butt in here in a second. Do we have a microphone we can hand out to the audience for me to? Um, is one of the things that I'm really psychotic about is client appreciation parties, which I talked about in our opening statement. And I, I've helped implement this in a lot of companies throughout the country. I know that the uh, Michigan guys are here and they've implemented it and some other people. Um, but these client appreciation parties, when you can create this attitude of abundance and you bring people together to share ideas openly for an hour and a half and say, what's going on? What, what are we doing that? The first 40, 50, 40, 45 minutes is what's going on in the marketplace? Because see, the general agent, average agent, is 90, 120 days behind what's going on in the marketplace, right? And the public's four to six months behind what's going on in the marketplace, right? Articles are coming out saying the market's great. Well, the truth is there's segments within the market. So we want to dissect what's going on in new construction, what's going on in upper end existing, what's going on in lower end existing, you know, and understand what's going on in the marketplace so everyone can be knowledgeable to better serve the client in that process. Then we walk around the room, inevitably. Everybody in that group, one is you got to take it serious. We don't want you to be saying, i got to show a house or i got a buyer. You, you know this a month in advance. Book around this hour and a half. If you don't take it serious, don't be part of the group. We're okay with that, okay? But what's one thing that you're focused on to grow your business today? Share, because we want that Darren Hardy approach. We want them to have insane focus and understand what is the one thing they're doing to make sure they're growing their business to the next level. And in the last 30 minutes, is always a subject. Two or three people will come in and share ideas. They just went to... To, to Tom Ferry and Mike Ferry, so they come back and say, what are my biggest takeaways from that? Um, and investors, or we talk about, we talk about listings a lot from last year, okay? What's a pre-listing call, a pre-listing packet, or a video, or social media. But we're always having either everyone in the room go around and say one thing, or two or three people go do some research and come back about sharing that subject matter. Steve, I know you, and Scott, I know you, uh, since we were here last year, have started mastermind groups. Could you talk a little bit about the impact that you I, see? I probably don't need a microphone. Okay. Um, we're recording this. So oh, you sorry. Use it. That's okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm Scott Simpson. I'm a Senior Vice President and Managing Broker with Burke Chapel Home Services, Georgia Properties. And after we were here last year, as brokers and leaders, we've heard about mastermind groups, and some of you may have that. Um, I've been on the management side now for 27 years. I've never actually had a mastermind group, but after we left last year, uh, and we, hearing the folks speak and, and the panelists, and they would reference, oh, in my mastermind group we did this, or in my mastermind group we, we did that. So when I got back to Atlanta, I said, we're going to start a mastermind group. So we did. Ben shared his materials with me. Thank you very much. And it has been a game changer. It's been a game changer. We've got uh, one group with 15 of our top associates, all chairman circle agents. Um, they, uh, we meet the third Wednesday, they pick the curriculum, someone speaks, I attend the meetings, but really only to pick up the tab. Uh, I don't, uh, they don't want to hear Scott talk. This is their meeting, if I learned that, it's agent driven and agent led. That's the important thing, it's not about two agents dominating the conversation, or three, or you as the facilitator, as the manager or broker, it's about everybody participating. And they have to understand this is about collaboration and teamwork and learning together. Each agent picks it. Before we meet again, and before we adjourn, they pick a topic. Someone volunteers to present that topic, and they do a great job. The first meeting was the Dream Board or Vision Board, and you didn't get into the meeting. That was your ticket into the first meeting. It was to create a Dream Board or a Vision Board, and it was, it was amazing. Agents that I thought would say, oh, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to create a Dream Board. I'm not going to that crazy mastermind meeting. They were the first ones to volunteer to present theirs. I'm going to tell you a crazy thing about dream boards that we're going to get off mastermind groups is when we do this for the first time with the group, half of them do not want to do it. Half of them are excited about doing it. But the half that don't want to do it, they come and almost without exception, like, I'm glad I did it. The other thing out of a group of 15, your over-unders on people crying is four. People are going to cry. 
I had, I had an ultimate fighter guy. I mean, he started crying like a baby. The guys cry more than the girls. I don't know what the hell's going on. He'll be charged. Girls, you guys are carpets or something. <laughs> So, um, guys, anyone that wants any information on that, but I'll tell you, our top producers all show up. Steve, you have that? Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I guess. Um, so I'm Steve Pace. I'm with Butcher Happy Home Services, Michigan Real Estate. Um, we started two groups, um, one in Eastern Michigan, which I'm the regional manager for, and then one in Grand Rapids with Mark and a couple other agents. And I know that with my Eastern Michigan group, I have uh, 12 people 12 people in there, there's 15, so I, I just opened it up to two more groups. But the people in there, the ideas that they're coming up with in the sharing, it's been amazing. And this is a top agent group, so I just took the top 12 you know, from the highest production down. And the things that they're doing that they wouldn't do, getting outside your comfort zone like you talked about, it is amazing the things that these agents are doing because of this group. And it's the same thing, I just there to facilitate and to pay the tab. Um, and you know, and they're they're picking the topics, they're picking the time and date, and everything else. They both keep talking about facilitating paying a tab. <laughs> That's actually we believe an important part of this is we actually get off site. Yeah. We go to, to the rooftop of pitch, or we go down to the Kona, the sushi place, or somewhere else, and we're doing the afternoon. I'm like, have a couple of drinks and some appetizers, or we'll go do breakfast, or we'll go do lunch, or whatever. We want to get off site so they're insanely focused on what we're doing, not. Not to distract and saying I need to run back to my office or having their mind somewhere else. And we believe that that's been an important part of doing this. Oh, I have 13 of these guys that I sit in every single month, and I have a manager sitting those with me to help make sure that everyone's showing up and they know the time and the subject matter and so forth. One other thing I forgot to mention that, at least in Eastern Michigan, I haven't done it in Grand Rapids yet, but if they don't commit or they miss, they're gone. We're kicking people out now because it's getting popular. So. If you're making the commitment, you have to do it. You have to be there. And like you said, they have 30 days or whatever to, to set the appointment. So We always started off by me describing the attitude of abundance and what that means and how important that is to be part of this group. That if people are going to sit there and listen and not share, they're not going to be part of the group. That doesn't work with us in our organization. So uh, we have a couple of mass writing groups, too, that, that are successful. But, you know, when we, we really... We're talking about culture, and I had a fascinating conversation with my 17-year-old son when I told him I was going to talk about culture. I looked at him and I said, what do you think culture is? And he's kind of an intellect, and he said, well, it's the social norms and behaviors of human groups. <laughs> you know, and I was like, well, that's true, but what does that mean to you? How do you execute on it? You know what I mean? This is, this is my 17-year-old son. It was interesting what he, what he said. He said, well, as a leader for you, I'm sure you could dictate culture, but that wouldn't work. Wow. wow. I thought that was pretty insightful. Wow. And he was dead on. So as, as, we, as I looked at this topic, and I really thought, what is it? What is culture? And I've always said that you've achieved the right culture when you cannot figure out how to describe it appropriately. It's like the intangible feel good. That's what everybody wants. That's what you desire. That's what everybody wants to be part of. So the only thing that I know how to do is to set an expectation that we want that. And then everybody in the room has to decide how they want to participate in getting there. But we all want to go to the same place. And, and, and I can't stress that enough that, that it's my job as a leader to stay the course and stay focused, completely focused, and, and, and talk about the wildly important goals. You've probably heard that term. If you haven't, you need to embrace it and narrow them down. So I have two. Two for our management group. Different ones depend upon the different groups. But as a company, the, all the other stuff happens. So you know, the invoices come in, all that, 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 that. That's all business. That's stuff we will continue to do on a regular basis. But what we focus on happens. So what is it that we want to focus on? And I'll just share really briefly that I have a, uh, I'm the youngest of nine children. So growing up, I had, you know, lots of parents. <laughs> and my oldest brother said to this to me when I was probably 13 or 14. And Vince, you talked about this earlier in the day about you needed coaches in your life. Well, I had a whole bunch of them built in. <laughs> but they were great coaches. And my oldest brother said this to me a long time ago. He looked at me and he said, there are three different types of people in this world. There are people that make things happen. There are people that watch things happen. And there are people that wonder what the hell happened. Which one are you doing? <laughs> That's true. And it is true. And so, and I say that only because it starts with every single person. It's not just my job as the leader to want to have a culture that we all desire. It's 
every single person's job. And that's the difference, I think, is, is the successful cultures embrace that. Every person in the room gets it and embraces it and does their part to make it all happen. I agree with that. I think it starts with leadership. It, it, it best starts with leadership. If leadership can show that and it's not the work, I love that conversation. I, I, I talk about it, I'm like, well, you know, it's the physical aspect of what we've done and we try to create a culture here. And it's the events that we do, whether it's through a charitable event or something else. But the part that people can't get that I get in debates with, and I'm like, you, I just can't, you can't express it to them until they literally come to your office and fill it, is the energy. The energy and the excitement. And I remember uh, last year when we had Seth Fasten in, um, I had a bunch of agents, because we use it kind of as a recruiter, we invited a bunch of our competitors to come. And one of the top agents in another company uh, said this number of agents, says, I finally get it. He says, there is an energy here that cannot be replicated anywhere in our marketplace. And it's not just Vince and the energy that he has. It wasn't just Seth and the energy he had as a speaker. But the entire audience had an energy. And you can't describe that to people until they literally feel it. So Ron, one of my, I sold my company to Home Services here. And, and the reason I really did it was because he offered me a job to focus on culture and coaching and leadership. Um, and, and a big part of that for me to even agree to do that was I said, Ron, I'm not jumping in a plane flying all over the country going to talk to companies. I don't have time to do that nor do I want to do that, that's not fun. And one of the things we've agreed is I said, the best way I know to really have people embrace and understand our culture is having them fly in and watch a sales meeting, to sit in a recruiting session, to sit in a mastermind group, and they'll feel the energy. I said, they're gonna see that and understand that so much better than me going out and saying, oh, here's what we do. Thank you. And so it is almost impossible to explain and describe that energy and that vibe that exists in a space until you're there and see it. Absolutely, and you know, uh, in addition to that, I also think that it, it does involve some of the hard conversations. So uh, again, I kind of had a new perspective arriving in California when I did, after having been in the industry for as long as I have, that, that I was able to have some of the conversations with like department heads or different people in the organization where I said, why are we doing it something this way? Why are we doing that way? And then they would describe it to me, and oftentimes it was because we've always done it that way which I actually have a hard time swallowing any time I hear that. Um, but I just look, would look at them straight in the eye and I would say, do you think that's the best way to do it? And they would say, no. <laughs> and I would say, well, don't do it that way anymore. <laughs> I mean, I think sometimes you have to give people the permission to change that they know that they want to do. So those are the conversations that, in my opinion, have to happen in order to create the culture that you want. You can't just impose it or just live it, you actually have to kind of dig through some of the crap to get to the goods, if that makes sense. It's important. There's a great book to read on this. I heard this guy speak before. It's an admiral, Abercroft or something like that. It's, it's called It's Your Ship. And and he took, if anyone has seen, heard him or heard that before, he took the worst performing ship in the U.S. Navy and turned it within two years to the best performing ship with the re worst retention rate to the best retention rate. And all he did was focus on going to each person when he came on that ship, exactly what she said, and ask them, what are we doing well that we need to continue to build upon, but what are we not doing that we need to change to make this a better culture? And by getting their input, he says, now we don't have an open checkbook that we can do anything we want, right? Because culture does not need to be expensive. That's a myth, right? Uh, but by engaging your agents and your team in that process of getting their input and making them feel part of the decision-making process of what you're doing is a really powerful tool. And you can't do everything, but if you're sincere and you listen to those things and you do some of those and they see that you're doing some of those, you're going to be, it's going to be valuable and you're going to grow your business because of that. So I would encourage either watching him or, or uh, uh, reading that book. Yeah, you know, um, so, so you look at it from a leadership standpoint in a company and then you look at it from whether you're a single agent and you're your own team because I think you should talk about yourself as your own team and that you have this whole backup of a team which is really the organization behind you. No matter what you are asked, you have a team. I just think everyone should say those words, embrace it because it's true. Are you not part of every single agent's team? I am, therefore there's a team. Or whether you're an actual team lead and you have one, two, 12 agents underneath you, whatever the case is, the same rules apply in every aspect of creating and living the culture that you want to have. And I say that because many of the mastermind agents that get together and share those concepts um, also apply them masterfully within their own teams. And that oftentimes is the differentiator between their, why they're successful. 
But does any, I, I, I'm gonna ask you to read my mind. I have one key component of every successful culture that I think is key. Can anyone guess what that one thing is? Anyone, anyone, any ideas? Fun. Or even your own input? Fun. Fun. Collaboration. Collaboration, who else said something? Someone said fun. Fun, fun. 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 Yeah. Drink start too. Honesty. Passion. Passion, honesty. I think it's fun. Who said fun? Gretchen. Awesome. It is fun. You have to have fun. If you are not having fun, go home. Find your fun and come back. Not kidding. I mean, because people rely on you. If you here's what I ask, my, ask myself and ask other people. Are you the person that people say, when, when, when you check yourself and say, I need to surround myself with the people that are going to be good for me, are you one of those for them or are you not? Right. I apologize. You had your hand up and then I... It's okay. Oh, it something else. Are you sure? Ask it. We it were it in that book you were talking about. The book is very similar. It's called Turn the Ship Around. Yeah, so that's the book you were talking about. It's the same thing about the culture. Like I learned this uh, submarine. It was a failing submarine. Yeah. It took them two years to turn it around. It was David Marquette. It's just a fantastic book. Yeah. We'll turn the ship around. Right? Same, same, same theory. Same, same theory. theory. Yeah. Absolutely. One of the stories... Go ahead. Well, I was going to mention... Uh, I think you both mentioned this, but when you talk about, particularly in an office with maybe 50 to 100 agents, is the importance of your of your staff, yes. your admin, and then also having to make tough decisions when you have maybe an agent and who might be a producer who is uh, negative to your, I'll, you know, I'll put that kindly, yes, is uh, not conducive to your culture, and having to make tough decisions as a leader. Would you either of you or both of you comment on that? I can totally comment on that. It's one of the things that I have been on. Um, our most successful managers in our in our company have set a tone with the following words. Come on into our office, come on be part of our company, come be, come be part of our culture, and you, our staff can never say no to you. They can never say no. They need to find a way to figure out what the answer is, but it shouldn't be an automatic no. Conversely, you may never abuse our staff. Period. And so uh, I will give you an example. There was a, unfortunately, we had a good producing agent who was abusive to one of our staff members and we just let him go. The staff is, at, at, the staff is an integral part of our organization. One is, so you got to make sure that you treat them. We uh, had a little fun day on Friday. Or went to a, a lot our, of fun day. A lot of fun day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're never going to leave. <laughs> uh, we were having a pool and we drank and, and we got away with it. Our staff is an integral part of it. And, and we do set an expectation for our staff that the agents are our client. So we want them to understand that. But the same thing, you've got to set the expectations you're talking about with the agents. You've got to be respectful to the staff because the staff is there to help you to make your life easier and more productive. And so there's got to be that mutual respect in that process. Um, but we want the staff, we, I've been adamant. One of the reasons I love being in a single office, and I know not everyone can do that geographically, is because I want that staff, I, I've been adamant in my conversations with other people, is we're not gonna let our staff leave our office and put them in a corporate office somewhere else. Because people are coming in and walking in and out of that office on a daily basis, asking questions for them to help them as part of that process. And we believe that's really core to our foundation is having them there to be able to interact on a, person, on a regular basis versus having them off-site. And so that's been important to us. Would you, Carrie is manager of my staff, would you agree with that? We have a very young yeah. staff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm 21 and... 21, I hired her. <laughs> I did hire her when she was 18. She opened yeah. doors at a, at a bar. Yeah, I, from <laughs> opening doors to at a bar to here. Yeah, we, we have a great staff. Talking to I microphone. Think, you're, yeah. you're telling everyone else to. I know, that's fine. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to talk. So I just think it's really important for us in our office to feel like, you know, we want just as much as agents want to enjoy what they're doing. You know, we're wearing these shirts, do what you love, love what you do. We want to come to work every day and enjoy where we are. And I feel like when we create that positive energy in our office, it, it really helps the agents feel like they're welcome to come in and ask questions. And just having a welcoming environment with a positive energy is so important. I thought. Have you ever had like a mastermind with staff to kind of create that? You know, no, but we did dream boards. We do dream boards regularly. Yeah. Not at, but we will ask them for the input periodically. Okay. It's not really a mastermind, okay. but periodically we will ask if we think stars right. We feel really good about things right now, so I'm on drywall or something. But uh, <laughs> but 
But if we start feeling things are getting negative in any sense, I and or her will go and talk to all staff members and say, hey, what are we doing well? What do we need to do? Uh, every now and then I will play, um, there's a Zig Ziglar uh, video about the power of positive attitude where he's got a woman that wants to come up on stage. He's just got a really bad attitude and says she hates everything about her job. And he says, well, here's what I'm going to do. And she's just negative. He says, I can see her walking across the stage. He says, she walked up, she says, he says, you got a, you got a problem. She says, I got a problem. He says, yeah, I think you're going to get fired soon. She's like, I'm going to get fired soon. I've got the problem. All the people I work with is the problem. <laughs> and so in that, he said, I want you to write down. And, and we have our staff do this period. What's one thing that you, or what's five things that you like about your job? And this lady's like, well, this is going to be a really easy exercise. I don't like anything about my job. He's like, do you get paid? He's like, yeah. She's like, do you like getting paid? Yeah. Do you have an office? Yeah. Do you have benefits? I mean, so the next thing she's writing down, she ended up writing down 21 things that she actually happened to like about her job. He says, when you go home at night and you go to bed, I want you to change out from the word I like to I love about my job. And she says, I want you to say every one of those 21 things. And it's just about that mindset again, about how you change that mentality. So. The thing is, I do think they can exist within a staff and with agents and with us as human beings, is we can slowly change people's mindset. And one of the things that we talk about on a regular basis is doing simple acts of kindness. And I believe every single person has the ability to create an environment and a culture around them by doing simple acts of kindness, kind, simple acts of kindness, where basically they're going to have a much more positive environment. And an example is we have a thing called a good guy award, okay? And we have an agent that used to work with us that his name was Gus, that has no arm. He had been rolled over in a traffic when he was like seven or eight years old. He lost his arm and he went on to play college basketball for a little bit. And the guy is always so crazy, upbeat and positive. And so we had a lady walking in uh, to the office one day and she was just having a bad day. She's in a bad mood and she's getting coffee. And she and so she's talking about this and she had the good guy word at the time. So she gave the good guy word the next time she gave it to Gus. She says, all of a sudden she says, there, nothing's going right. And I hear this little voice come over the cube saying, Lynn, how are you doing? Isn't it a great day today? And she's like, okay, here's Gus. No arm. He's positive. He's upbeat. You know, but doing these simple things, opening doors for people, right? Helping people out. Telling people I enjoy it. Nobody says this to me. I like what you're wearing. You know, be genuine. <laughs> um, but when you're sincere and you do little simple acts of kindness that literally take seconds to do, you can all of a sudden take somebody that's in a bad mood turn their day around by being positive, right? And all of a sudden, they start becoming positive, and that's contagious. It resonates throughout the environment that you're in. And so these little things can do that. Um, and, and I think it's very, very powerful. I remember I was speaking down in Florida, Ray Mason, if you know Ray Mason once, and Alan Dalton, who's gonna be here speaking tomorrow, uh, was there. And I was talking about simple acts of kindness uh, in the speech, and he went and got me a bottle of water and ran it up to me. He said, I only got four left today. <laughs> But, but it is little stupid things, guys, that I'm telling you that make a really big difference. So don't think those little things don't matter. One of the things that I learned from my buddy Mark Stark, and I think Gino does also, is, is I call everybody on their birthdays. I need you to send the birthdays today. I call everyone on their birthdays and happy birthday. It's amazing to me how many people say, I cannot believe that you take time to call me to wish me happy birthday. It seems like it doesn't matter, but I'm telling you, it's powerful. First. First of all, Vincent, I do love what you're wearing. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you. Thank you. When, when, when Rob Peltier came here, he denounced that we were selling, this is pretty much what I had on, flip-flops, holy jeans, and some crazy shirt. And he didn't have a tie on. I'm like, wow, so I poked fun at him. He says, I would have worn jeans like that, but I don't have any. He said, we're going to buy you some for Christmas. So now we'll see. If we buy those, we'll see if you wear them. I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. But you got to poke fun at people, right? <laughs> Is this working? I think it's working. So the other thing was, Mary Lee, you mentioned um, the wildly important goals, and I think sometimes having set, you know, I'm, I'm rereading now the four disciplines of execution, and you can't help but get something out of it every time. And the, or the idea of having one or two wildly important goals, everyone in the whole kind of community, learning community that you, you work in, are pursuing seems to take some of the question or the variability out of the whole thing. Now, everybody knows what path you're on and what you're going after. And I wonder if you could talk to that a little bit. You, if you folks kind of zero in on a couple of things and, and how that helps the culture, you know? 
Yeah, well, I think it's huge. So I think it takes a, it's like a rudderless ship until everybody knows where it's going. You know, I mean, you have to get everybody on board, not just on board, but buy in. And the only way that that happens is through repetition and through that continual focus on those one or two things or three things, whatever the case is. Not more than three, though, because it's not humanly possible. I mean, I love my husband and my two sons, but I will tell you, these men, they cannot do more than one thing at a time. At least my men in my house. I was just going to say that. Oh man, if I get them focused on that one thing, we're good to go. They are going to get it done. But that's what you have to do, I think, as being a leader, whether it's your team, your office, whatever the case is, you have to stay focused so that everyone can join you, and then you then you actually get, get to where you're going. That's my opinion. Brooke, I'm going to ask you this question and Carrie too. I think not only that, I think it's also critical that they understand your passion about what you're doing, the mission, and that you that you firmly believe in it. Because I think sometimes leaders will say, let's go do something, and they're not even sure if they believe in what they're doing themselves. So when we're talking about explosion and people are saying this is a crazy idea, I was passionate about it, I firmly believe in it, and then you guys just kind of follow suit, really, and then we have an insane focus on getting it done. Is that a fair statement? Yes. 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 Yeah, I don't know if they believe that, but... <laughs> the one thing is we tell these people, we're telling like, you know, be transparent with us. Come and talk to us. We need you. We need to be open to our staff and our, our agents. I would say the 4DX model, the 4 discipline execution, allows everybody in your organization to find where they align to the organization's mission. So when the mission is clear and that conversation is consistent, when the organization's mission is clear and the conversation is consistent and it's a, it's a stable part of the environment and the culture, it allows everyone in the organization to see where they align, where their personal mission, where their vision, and their beliefs, and what's important to them aligns with the organization's the umbrella goal. And then when you have that, you have buy-in and alignment, and then it's explosive and exponential and growth. And then it's a tangible culture. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's just really a, a, a continuation of importance to, to take what you just talked about with that, the 4DX and aligning everything, but, but you can't lose focus because you can get totally, you know, waylaid on, on, on the minutia. Don't get stuck in the minutia. The minutia happens every single day and you've got to make sure you're able to pull your feet out of that and keep going so that you can stay focused on the goal because it's really stuck, easy to get, get sidetracked on those things. Sure. One of the things I wanted to talk about, and, and we'll have this up here if anybody wants to grab this article, um, and we can also electronically send this to anybody that wants it, is Elon Musk was talking about, to his management team and his leadership team, about what's the most effective way to communicate. Um, and in the article, he basically goes on to say, he says, listen, there's two ways of managing. There's the trickle-down effect where you have the pyramid where you've got to report to your boss, your boss got to report to his boss, and so forth. And he says, if that's your mindset, he says, you need to start looking for another job because that's not how we're going to manage our company. He says, there's other one which is more of a horizontal management. And one of my agents sent this to me. He said, I really think this is part of who you are uh, as an organization. Where basically it says, listen, if you need to go to your boss's boss or you need to go to someone in another department, you go to whoever you can to either resolve the issue soonest and fa fastest, right? Or, or to help you figure out what is the project you're working on. That we don't have time to go through these processes of going through people for the sake of going through people. If you need to go to me to, because of a project you're working on to help us accomplish our goals as soon as possible, that's what we want to do. Philosophically, that's where we are. So I was talking to an, an agent at another organization here in Omaha that's coming over here, and, the, and his question to me was, well, who will be my manager? And that was such a stupid question to me. I'm like, who, I'm like, you can call me, you can call Brian, you can call Heather, you can call whoever you want. I'm like, we don't assign managers to you. I said, because if you've got something, I'm in a mastermind group that just started five minutes ago, I'm going to be tied up for the next hour and a half, and you need a question. You shouldn't have to wait for me to get out of that meeting to get back to me. Sometimes my days are so crazy, I'm booked three, four hours at a time. And so I don't want you to wait. So our point is, you go to whoever, in whatever department, for whatever issue you have, for whatever project you're trying to work on, and get an answer from them. I don't care if you're jumping a boss or whatever it is. That's philosophical how we work. Our agents understand that. I believe our staff understands that. And everyone's got to put their ego and check that door from a manager's perspective because they're upset someone's not coming to them. Um, so I have a new office in a really small mountain town. And um, there's just two of us in that office. And I guess like the one thing that I was going to ask you guys, oh man. Um, 
do I have to stand up to? You do not have to stand okay. up. Okay. That's just, just more awkward. Um, so yeah, so we have this little small office in a real, like a little mountain town in Durango, Colorado. And one thing that I was wondering how you guys would approach is how to convey this new culture to an industry that is really set in their ways. Like they've already, you know, there's not very many new agents in this really small town. Most of those agents have been around for a long time. And then it's just, you know, a younger agent and then my older teammate and how to convey to them this culture and like the innovative technologies because I feel like they kind of look at us like, oh yeah, you're just that millennial, you know, like, oh yeah, what are you going to bring to the table? So how Take do you my that point of put her on the spot. <laughs> Deb, Deb uh, is one of our top agents, she's been in the top 10 many times, uh, was a top agent in the state, I don't know, 15, 20 years in a row, and she's mentoring 7, 8, 9, 10, mostly younger agents. Can you talk to that? Because I think that there's, there's a really important blend of experienced older agents, understand the value that they can pick up and ideas they can pick up from younger agents and vice versa. Obviously the younger agents pick up on the experience. Can you can you speak to that question? Yes, I think to answer your question, I think the main thing you have to do is model what you're doing. And if you model it, it will catch on. I mean that's that's really what Vince did in the city. He it was an eyeball. Um, I mean he was. He was. I think there's a better word than that. <laughs> <laughs> but what he did is he modeled, he didn't just say what they were going to do, but he really modeled that and showed that to the rest of us. And slowly, I mean, I tried for years to tell him you shouldn't dress like that. That wasn't good. My, my, dad, my dad's in the back. Deb's, Deb's there. My mom, they all told me if I did not wear a suit and tie, I would never be successful. So I have not bought one since 1996. I, and I said, if I die and my dad tries to put me in a suit or tie, someone take that damn thing off. But I think modeling that and then watching when I when Vince asked me to coach this group of young people, I mean they were asking me questions about how do you get onto the platform for this well I don't even have a computer on my desk. <laughs> Why don't you uh, tell us what your best takeaway is with this? And what what I ended up doing is saying thank you for your help on that. I really appreciate that. Maybe you could teach us more in depth in the next meeting. But I said I understand where my deficiencies are, and you'll suck us. You'll suck us in real quick. If you help us out and share with us what you're doing, yeah. continue modeling the great things that you're doing, and I promise you, even us old dogs will. We'll say, hey, we like this. this yeah. Way of doing it. So we kind of started just a helpful whether this would apply or not, but we just started kind of a campaign to say let's create the masters with the millennials. And it was just combining those two, the masters of the business, and then the millennials who want to figure out how to be a master, but they bring, and, and, and the common theme behind it was, don't be surprised when the student becomes the teacher, because yeah. it will flip. Well, because like, and so it should. Teams, well, so I and stuff are coming. Like, everybody sees as far as like, oh, sorry, <laughs> right? Um, for the listings and stuff, as far as the sales go, they're off the charts because everybody sees that what we can bring and it's something new and different and the culture is different. And people walk into our office and they see that, but it's just the agents that are just kind of like so the big think? bad wolf that just opened in this really small town and they're they're just like, where did they come from? It's, you know, it's hard not, to deny the fact, so the, the truth of the matter is last year, 42% of all the houses bought in the United States were by millennials. Yeah. This year, so they're... they're they, more than any other generation, no matter what baby boomers happen to believe, are buying houses, right? So I think if you just put some simple facts out there and talk about what we're talking about here, embracing change, and they see how these people are utilizing social media to connect and communicate with these other people. And I think you just lay out the facts of how these successful people that are millennials are becoming successful and how, and how here's the masses and, and we have to, as a baby boomer or whoever we're targeting at the time, got to understand how to communicate with this generation. I think you bring those facts together and, just, and they, they become intrigued, really, in saying, okay, you know, because if they stop learning, they're dying. Yeah. So you've got, to, you've got to embed them in that, listen, you've got to, to learn these type of ideas because if you don't, you're not going to reach the largest generation that's buying houses today. And then my only other suggestion might be ask them if they have a willingness to work more closely together. I mean, ask. Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, yeah. That's, it's a question nobody wants to ask. Ask. Yeah. Yeah. So since the beginning of the year, my office has grown by 50 people. We're up uh, to 250. Very cool. And it's a big, that extra 50 over 200 is a big change. Um, they're bringing in their own culture. We brought in a really large That's team. all because you came here last year, right? That's right. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were doing masterminds. I'm doing more masterminds, but it's getting harder to reach um, all of the individuals in the office. And I'm hearing things like, we're getting too big. We're not doing some of the things we used to do. How do you get to that next Well, probably nobody has built that more than me, okay? We got 650 people in this office, and the fear running around that we sold is we're gonna become corporate, we're things are gonna change, blah, blah, blah. I lead every sales meeting. Now, we only do them two to three times a month, because preparing for sales meetings is not really that much fun. I don't know if you guys know that or not, but I don't really get excited spending all Monday night preparing for sales meeting. But, but, I lead that sales meeting, and it's partly to stay in contact with these people. We started our mastermind groups at 12 people. They're all at 15 people. Again, 13 of those people, um, and, and we have a waiting list, and we don't let uh, buyers agents on teams get on those because I don't have enough time. But when you when you make that commitment as that manager, that leader of that organization, to go sit there with them an hour and a half every month and do that, you stay in touch with them. But you've got to do the little things. We just had a grill out on Thursday night. Um, and so I think you've got to do the little things that says, listen, we are becoming a big company, but we still have a little company family mindset. And when you stay engaged and you're active in facilitating the mastermind groups and doing the sales meetings and doing the events and doing one-on-one -on -one coaching with them, and, they, and you're still available to them. Because see, one of the big keywords for millennials is being approachable. Do not sit behind your desk in your third floor office on a corner overlooking the park and have them come in and meet with you. I never meet with an agent behind my desk. I always meet with them at the conference room because this generation, second of all, is we're doing this together. We are partners in this. It is not I telling you what to do. So if, if you're available, and the great thing about technology is we can be available when we're laying on the beach, okay? So don't drink till noon, that's my rule. <laughs> Tell people you can get a hold of me in the morning, but be available and, and be present. And, and this is, in my opinion, where the pivotal change for you could be those random acts of kindness. Because that brings back that human element or that human touch. Because for that moment in time, the recipient of that random act of kindness is, is like with you. So that's what I would do. And that's what I try to do when we talk about birthdays. Every single my, one of my employees gets a birthday card, an anniversary card on their work anniversaries. I mean, we have like 365 employees. So it's crazy, but it's worth it. Mark, Andy, we got some people. We got, I think most of the people in this room that I know are brokers, managers, but I got a couple people that are running some pretty big teams. Would, would any of you that's running a big team, Mark or anyone, be willing to stand and say one or two things that you think you've done to create a culture? I know you take your team to Turks and Caicos. Yeah. In other places, we were talking about that last night. Um, Andy, I don't know if there's something else that you would like to speak on, but I'd like, from, a, from an agent team perspective, Jeff, yeah. from an agent team perspective, I'd like a couple of you guys people to say things that would allow us as managers and owners to go back to maybe get some ideas to our teams that can help them with their culture. Yeah, sure. Um, well, um, yeah, so I run a small team. Um, six. I got six people on it. Uh, for culture, I have sales goals. And... Um, you know, I, I've, I've actually learned so much from Vince and being on the Rethink Council and so much about culture. I actually want to say one quick thing about culture. Culture starts with you. You can't wait for culture to show up in an organization. You have to be the culture. So you make it. So it's an internal locus of control, not external. So when you make the culture, people want to be around you. So, you know, I focus on experiences not gifts or discounts or you know you're getting an extra bonus because a bonus just is the so all of the culture stuff that I do are all just experiences so if it's hitting sales goals and going on a trip or doing a weekend getaway up north in wine country um, you know going and doing a treetops like high ropes course thing or even just going and 
we got this new thing in Grand Rapids called bowling. I don't know if you guys know what it is, but it's awesome. It's bowling with a football. Oh. So you're like throwing football at pins. I, I, you know, it's just like it's fun experiences. So, you know, I, that, I guess that's all I'd like to say about culture. Just, you know, make it an experience. And it's, it's your job to make the culture. Deborah yeah, raised her hand back there. One of the things why well, we think that to death is there's an article I'd like to share. Um, I think we have, I think we tried the other day, um, that was Forbes or Fortune had um, about a year or two ago that came out and they said, is customer service getting wor worse because of millennials? And so it walks through this question and it was saying, you know, what's going on with customer service? Um, because millennials is what I call a now generation. Instant gratification has no patience. And this article basically goes on to say that that has trickled up through all generations, that we all now became instant gratification, no patience as a society. And, and the moral of the story is at the end of the day is that millennials pushed us and that customer service is not getting worse, but the expectation because of technology and this generation is that the level of customer service we deliver today must be, must be much greater than it ever has been in the past. And so I think we need to be cognizant of that, and we need to remember that. We, we'll share that article. It's in the binder, actually. That article may be in the binder. Yeah. Okay, there you go. You can read the article. You already have it. Yeah. I just want to say this, and I don't think that this is um, something that you probably want me to talk about. That's fine. Go ahead. <laughs> I think we're open. We're transparent. <laughs> I think this is important for you all to know. Um, your agents are being recruited by other companies. Well, I, I clearly know that. <laughs> we, Vince and I just went through that. Um, a company offered me things that, I mean, Vince's eyes were poppy open. I was shocked. It was... I said, we're not matching that. <laughs> well, it's, I it's, you got my charm, my charisma. <laughs> That's worth $100,000. Yeah, I mean, these numbers are crazy that your agents are being offered now. But in the end, it came down for me. A, the ability to go in and talk to him and say, I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't looking for this. This is what was dropped in my lap. But the bottom line, the reason I stay is because of the culture and the company that's here. That is a factor that money can't buy. And if you create that, you're not leaving no matter what happens. Isn't it true human behavior internally we all want to be something part of something bigger than us? I saw Brian Thomas, my manager, walk around here uh, the other, uh, earlier today, and he said, uh, and I was always scared when I heard this guy, okay? His family was was part of, he married into Duncan Aviation. They read private plans. They had an obscene amount of money. He meant for me to work. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, why do you want this job? He's like, you know, I want to do something that's meaningful to me. And I was always scared he was going to retire because, you know, when you don't have to work, it's scary. And then he started becoming so scared that I was going to sell the company and retire, and I didn't have to work. But the great thing is we both, both always had this passion for what we're doing, and we love, basically, in my opinion, enriching the lives of others. But he just told an agent to me the other day, he said, you know, the last 14 years of my life has been, and he's 70 years old, has been the best 14 years of my life because I've been something, part of something bigger than I ever could have been individually. And that really comes to create a culture that when you create something, it becomes contagious throughout your entire organization, and they feel part of something special. When we went Entrepreneur Magazine or The World's Greatest or any of these things, it's not about just me and the management team, right? It is about everybody in that organization. And they now feel like they're part of something that they couldn't be part of elsewhere or on their own. And I, and I think that makes everybody in the organization feel good. Is, is that fair to say? You know, and that, that leads me just to the word respect. I, I, I can't... She just died. <laughs> I don't care. Let's play, let's play one of her songs in a break. We got 15 minutes in a break. Let's go get a break. Let's go get a break. Go break. Exactly. But in all sincerity, respect of every single human being and expecting the reciprocal is critical. I, I can't tell you. I, I am, as a leader, I will never ask anybody to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. And I just, this real real time story for you. I was in our uh, kitchen, and the sink was disgusting. The sink was just disgusting. So I was like, oh my god, we got to clean the sink. So I'm in there cleaning the sink, and I had employees walk in and said, well, why 
I have to clean in the sink? I said, because it was disgusting. And I'm not going to put my food or anything near that. And they said, well, you don't have to do that. And I said, why? I eat here. I mean, and, and that's how I think every single leader should be. And I'm not saying to be that I think I'm better than anybody else. In fact, I'm very humbled by the whole experience when I step back and looked at it because that's how every human being should be. We are all human beings, last I checked. No one is better than anybody else. We're all going to leave this earth the same way. So don't make any mistake about that. And I, if I can, for a moment, just tell you that you can keep talking. So you and I. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, so you and I met how long ago? Not that long ago. Within the last couple of years. A couple of years ago. And um, so I'm not standing up and bouncing around and moving around like I usually do when I'm talking. But I hope that you can feel a little bit of a passion in me because I definitely have it. But what I think is interesting is that we gravitated towards each other, and we were in completely two different worlds. Didn't know each other at all, and now I'm very honored to be here talking about this very topic with you because of that same gravitation, that passion, and that respect, because that's what life is all about. And surrounding yourself with the same type of people is key, but respect them. Respect yourself so that you can earn the respect of others. You know, that brings up, I'm trying to remember who said that. Someone said, get the losers out of your life, <laughs> right? <laughs> and it sounds harsh. But those people that suck the negative energy, that are full of negative energy, that suck the life out of you, get them out of your life. Surround yourself with that are the right mindset, that are positive, that's going to that's going to have a passion and a zest for life, that's going to make you more productive. We got a couple questions out here, Terry. Yes, Chris. Um, thanks, guys. Appreciate it. I, last year I was here and went back all excited, and then got depressed in about a week because I realized that I have 20 offices spread out throughout New Jersey, and I was trying to look at what you had here and, and emulate that and it's just it's very difficult when you're not all under one roof. Yes. So Mary Lee, you're almost three times the size of our company, but you're you're wrestling with the same thing that I think a lot of us are here, and that is really bringing that culture to far reaching corners of your company. So can you just dig down a little bit deeper on that and talk about some of the things that you're doing to bring what Vince has done here to And that's a fair analysis because they're different models. You can yeah. apply some of the same principles, but it's more difficult because you've yeah. got 20 different cultures. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, and I and I absolutely do. I mean, I have 32 office managers, and every single one of our offices has a different culture. You know, I mean, it, but but that's what's cool about it. So you have to learn to embrace it. My mantra needs to be the same no matter which office I'm speaking in. That's critical because that's the company mantra. But the, but I grappled with that often. And so I deployed something very simple. It's the only thing I knew to do in order to touch. Because um, there are 52 week, weeks in a year and I have 58 offices. So even if I started, no, I wouldn't get done until two years from now. It just doesn't work to make the rounds realistically on a weekly basis. So I started something called Mary Lee's Monday Morning Minute. And I have a, <laughs> Ryan Finale, and I have a less than one minute video that I deploy through Facebook out to every single one of our agents. And it is, they all feel like they know me now. And, I, and it, it's strange what it's done, but it's awesome what it's done because it's accomplished part of that goal. And it's, it's, it's cultural things, it's motivational things. It's not about the business, they should know the business. Sometimes it is. Uh, but, but uh, you know, and I often say that. I'm not here to talk about the business. You should know what you're doing or you shouldn't be in this industry. I mean, it's very real, but it, it's a great way to deploy it and they look forward to it. Every single Monday morning, I can't tell you, I walk into an office and 20 people say, oh, I love your Monday morning minutes and I say, oh my God, I've created a monster. Now I have to keep doing this. That's great. But it's good. So, if that Isn't this a brace and change? We're taking video, technology, social media, and we're using that as a vehicle to reach our people in a different way than we had before. So that's part of it. We're still nurturing relationships in that process. So the principle flows through, right? Part of the question I think we've had, and I've been out to the company for, is, is you know, some of you, can you look, is it possible versus having 24 cultures to, to combine some of those offices? And I know in some cases, some people say yes, and some people say no. I have found, I know when I was out there in Pennsylvania for about three days, we were walking around, I, I asked the agents. What I did is I gave an inspirational speech, and then I sent the owners and managers out of the room, which was very, very scary for Doug at the time. I don't think he liked that at all. I think he had some serious anxiety. And I asked him, I said, what do you guys, what is, what's this company doing well? What do they need to improve on? But one of the questions that I processed, I said, I said, we, we, I think we're going to reach, I did three speeches, three different sections. 
And they said, would you guys drive an extra five miles? Because they were saying it's cool that they were saying they're collaborating and learning from each other and seeing each other. They don't do that often enough. I said, would you guys move and drive an extra five minutes, you know, for 10 minutes to come, if you could come to an office that would have more energy, more excitement, so on. And so many of them, Bill, right, said they would do that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and they were open to a lot of things. And so I would just say, challenge yourself, as he said, get outside of the box to look at it and say, where, are those, where do those possibilities exist? You're not geographically going to cover. I know the, the geographic area you cover, okay? I'm coming out here in a couple of weeks and you told me, someone said we had an eight minute drive from the airport. I'm like, oh, holy shit, where the hell do I <laughs> um, But But I would say, get out of the comfort zone and see where does that happen? Because why, why have I always been of this concept of a mega office? It's one is to control finances, okay? Let's not be confused from a business perspective. But it's two is to control culture. Because I understand I've got one culture, started with leadership, and it's easier to control that than if I have 20 cultures. You can have multiple cultures, but boy, you better be utilizing social media or something or figuring out how do we get them together. Yeah. And maybe it's having offices compete against each other. We have mastermind groups compete against each other. We have contests for two months spans at a time. Mm -hmm. Get them engaged in the process where you maybe bring them together at once and then have a contest or something like that. Now, Vince, what I've noticed uh, over the last five years, the one thing that Keller Williams has done that's a positive yes. is that they've proven to the broker, the agent, that they don't have to be in that same town. At least in New Jersey, suddenly people came from all over because of what they thought was an incredible idea of split. Right. They have no culture, though, backed by us, and so now we're seeing the reverse happen. They're starting to implode. Right. 250, 300 people in an office. Be careful. You better have, you better have a great culture. You better have a great exactly. culture. So they because if that's a bad culture, it's, it's, it's suicidal as a great culture is beneficial. So I think we can create market centers in some of our markets, and we don't have to live by this old colonialism of the Northeast where you have to have an office every five minutes from each other. But it's, it's we, I'm not sure I want to be the first. The other thing is, Chris, how many office managers do you have? 20. 20. Okay, so you, you need to engage them to emulate the same yeah. same model. Yeah. Quick, quick question here, and then we'll get the microphone here. Karen. Yeah, so that, uh, that gentleman's question was exactly my question. Um, well, so that's I'll, perfect. Yeah, but I, I want to, I'll, I'll go one step further. I'm not a gentleman either. <laughs> so, Vince, if you had, uh, eight offices around the Omaha Metro. Yes. What are three things you do to build culture? How would you preserve or build? Well, I, I've got. I'm thinking about this right this moment because I, I'm going to open up an office in Sarpy County. We're talking about the possibility of doing a merger with another company, and they're not all going to fit under this roof. So I would still try to have a hub. I, so I would call it more of a hub. So I would still try, even though people would have to. I would have sales meetings periodically, and I try to have them here, and we. I try to jam. 300 people in here, and we would just have to figure out how to make it work. I would make sure on a regular basis that I was having events where I pulled everybody together, uh, where it's not work-related, it's more family-related. Um, but and, and I would probably, quite honestly, the third one, I would figure out, I promote video all the time. I try to do Facebook Lives. I don't do them as often as I should. I would probably have to start utilizing video as a vehicle to connect them on a more regular basis. I'm going to tell you one of the things that I believe in, and, and this, I get this argument with people all the time because, because I said earlier, one of the threats to in industry is virtual offices, discount brokers. And virtual offices almost always become discount brokers, by the way, okay? Um, but I said, listen, nobody in the country is probably better suited to talk about brick and mortar than me. I built an 81,000 square foot building, which we're occupying between mortgage, or between title and ourselves, 75,000 square feet of the building. I believe brick and mortar, I want people to come to the office, whether it's mobile offices or single offices. If I've got a leader there that I trust or a manager I trust, I want people to come to the office. I said, here's where I think the industry's going over the next five years. People are going to go to, to discount brokers, low cost things, virtual offices, or they're going to go to brokers that have value, that have a great culture. And I believe that it's been proven throughout business after business after business that bringing top producers, the best of the best, are going to come to an environment where they're going to sit around other people, they're going to be a sponge to learn from other people on a daily basis, they're going to be encouraged and inspired by other people, there's going to be that friendly competition that exists and that energy that exists within a space and there's going to be a flock that most of the top producers are going to flock that way and other people that are looking at cost are going to go the other way. But if you look at Apple, the first company right to go over a zillion dollars in market cap, you look at Google, which is a company I've been fortunate enough to visit twice, uh, the number three uh, market cap in the, in, the, in the world. And Facebook, who I don't know if it's number four anymore after they lost $100 billion the other day, but they're still very far up there. All three of those organizations built their companies around campuses 
and physical space where people are coming together to work as teams, to collaborate with each other, to encourage each other. So this theory that I hear in this real estate world, that brick and mortar is dead long term, I fundamentally believe is absolutely not correct. Mark, Deb, would you be as successful if you worked out of your home? Not at all. I don't think it, it, it doesn't work. Scott? No, we bricks. The culture is, is in, having them come into the facility, the building, is part of the culture. Right. Culture and brick and mortar are related to each other if you want to have greatness, in my opinion. So I fundamentally believe that you can just look at the Apples, the Googles, and the Facebooks of the world and others, and they have proven that having brick and mortar, bring those people in there for that collaboration, for that experience, that excitement, that energy is created there, cannot be duplicated by doing it just by, because the virtual office is saying, well, we're gonna do webinars, we're gonna, but it's still not the same thing. And there's, and by the way, virtual agents, there's too many distractions, the Darren Hardy rule. There's way too many distractions, and most people are not self-disciplined enough to work out of their home. Just at Gary V, three or four months ago, in a small group for the morning, we had a small group of eight or nine that met with him for a morning, and, uh, he said the real estate world, profession, unlike mortgages, and he's working with Jason, one of his clients, to try to get out of the mortgage business because he says it's just completely changing constantly. But he said the real estate business, it's all about, just as you said, it's all about that culture. He believes that we have to evolve. You talked about video communication, but he said the, the very same things. People want relationships. Mary Lee, you mentioned authenticity at the very beginning. That's what he kept coming back to. And you just mentioned it's culture, brick and mortar, absolutely. What he, I mean, he's just another thought leader, like you folks are, and he's chiming in with the same words. Guys, they, they both have mentioned this. It, as you walk around our office, you saw my manager's office, he has mannequins, he has antiques. Every one of these offices have been personalized to their own personality. We encourage and we want our agents to be the unique individual that they are. People like you for who you are. Don't try to pretend to be somebody else to think that's going to make you pick up business or, or people are going to like you, okay? So you need to all create. Our culture works for us. Our culture may not work for everybody else. Each one of you individually need to go back to your teams and your organizations, and you need to figure out what you want your culture to look like, right? Come up with a three- and a five-year plan. And then you need to start implementing that and embracing that and living that and not just saying it but acting out on a daily basis. But every one of you can great, create a great environment, a great culture, and a great surroundings for you, your team, and your organizations to grow. But ultimately, you've got to sit down and figure out what that is and figure out how to get there. There is no one right way, guys, you'll hear me say this time after time, there's no one right path to get where you want to go for culture. But you do have to study human behavior. You've got to study generational trends. You've got to understand that that Millennial walking in there, we're going to be starting. We're going to be dealing with a new generation, guys, here in the next year or two. Okay, millennials are going to be all pissed off because so we're not going to be talking about this. Anymore. We're going to be talking about Z. There's another Z. I don't know what the hell their name is, but Generation Z is some other name I, I forgot. But Seth Madison said something to me, and, and we're setting up one right now that I, I I think is very intriguing. He said, if I was running a business, he said I would set up a board of directors or an advisory council of a bunch of 20, 25 year olds to understand how are they communicating. Because you know what? Millennials are still using Facebook. You go talk to a 15 year old, they think people using Facebook are old. Yeah. You gotta understand how to use new technologies and new social medias. So maybe go embrace and get, and so that's one of the things we're doing right now that we're gonna kick off here in the next 30 to 45 days is get a board of directors of younger ages, maybe some kids, not even in real estate business, to talk to them about how do we need to communicate? How are you connecting with people? They're going to understand the, the human behavior, the mindset of these new generations. Because if you don't understand approachability and letting them be the unique individual they are, and not being able to tell them they have to do this or this or this, you're going to lose them. They're not going to. They're not going to come to you. And you've got to be embracing teams in your organizations, guys. We're going to talk a lot about that in our roundtables. So just really quickly, so my my son's high school happens to be down the road from our corporate office. And um, they offer, if, you, if I will commit to this, to get it done before next year at this time, and I will report back, but the high schools want leaders in the community to come and speak to them. But what I want 
from those high schoolers is what they understand about real estate. Well, how would they go about setting up a business? And it is a fascinating conversation. My son hates it when he brings friends over and then I'm like, tell me what you think about this. You know, I like quarantine and everything. We start grilling on questions. So he's, now he doesn't bring his friends around. So. <laughs> it's important. Get out of our own. We're out of time, but we got one last question. Or, or, or statement. I don't know what we have. So we've moved on a little bit from what I was saying. Here. It was more the conversation about like how do you have a culture in multiple locations and the what happened in that in your area with the 300 agents. It's more the strength of the culture that has the impact. If your culture is stronger than the force of the agents coming here to the agents in the area, then they'll they'll join in. If it's not strong enough, it'll get watered down. And that's where that like one bad apple can spoil the bunch. You yep. talk to a bunch of the conversation of the people that are out of culture. And so it becomes this pack mentality where the strength of the culture binds the agents together or the community together and then they hold firm because the culture is important to them and then they will run out the people who are out of the stream. Last thought, we didn't talk about the guys. If you want younger agents, our organization is substantially younger than the average age of 59 in the real estate industry. Okay? <laughs> If you want younger ages, you've got to understand their mindset. They are the generation, the exact opposite of baby boomers, that want to come together and do things as a team. They want to collaborate. They want to do it together. They want to do it in a physical space, no matter what you believe. Baby boomers were me against the world and hell with everybody else. That is not the generation we have. So if, you do, if you're an organization that says you're team friendly, but your actions do not support that, I, I firmly believe real estate organizations that are not team friendly over the next five years are not going to be relevant. They are going to miss the change. They're not going to be in business. I've had this conversation with Ron Peltier and others, and he says, we've got to get out of the box and we've got to make our organizations understand that they've got to change things, which sometimes is tough. I mean, you've got to swallow your commission schedule and go redo it for a team friendly commission schedule. Those of you, I'd be happy, we are happy to share our commission schedules, anything that we have. You want it on mastermind groups. You want it on coaching, you want it on any program that we have, come and talk to me and we'll get it to you. We're an open book. We have people coming to this organization every single month, shadowing us for a day or two. If any of you want to come in here and you want to walk around and sit in, in sales meetings, sit in mastermind groups, sit in coaching sessions, sit in recruiting <coughs> sessions, you can do that. We don't care. We're very transparent what we want to do. We are here to help you guys. Let's go out there. Let's make sure we're embracing change. Let's create great cultures. Study the human behavior of others, understand what you want to do and how you want to accomplish it, and set a path to go do it. Okay. Thank you, guys. Thank you.